Greetings, brothers and sisters. So this is a video about how YouTube and Google and to some extent, you know, the right wing of the truth community and then all these social media, other social, big major social media platforms kill YouTube channels. And it's more than just that. It's, you know, I want to get into how it's done systemically. But first, I want to say I am not looking for advice on what to do suggestions, going here, going here, doing this, changing my content. I'm not, you know, if I ask for that, I ask for it. Otherwise, I'm not asking for it, right? I'm not soliciting, you know, unsolicited advice, right? Because it's always bad, especially what has to do with my YouTube channel. It's always bad. Like it's always, you know, people who've never done this, who don't really know anything about it, and they have an easy solution that works on their end but doesn't work for me at all, and they're not hearing me, right? And so I'm not asking for advice. I'm just telling you what happened, what I've gone through in over the years of having a YouTube channel since 2007 and watching everything go in a anti-truther direction, right? And they do it in a systemic way. So they don't target individuals and groups, right? Like you get all this right-wing truth stuff or remedial truther stuff, and they come out, hey, I got a leaked document. Hey, they got some leaked document. There's some leaked audio, some leaked document. There's no leaked documents, right? <laughs> Just stop. You're making that up, right? You're, you're a leaked document that you created. They're not stupid, right? These, you know, I mean, they are and they're not. But in terms of their criminality, they don't have secret meetings. They don't have to put out memos, right? They don't have to put out messages, you know, the MIAC report, that's like something different. It's a, a statewide thing, and it's it's not really as condemning or damning as some of these other things, these fake things they put out. They just all know what to do, right? These people who are part of the beastly system, whether they're in media, whether they're in politics, whether they're, you know, in corporations, they all know what they're supposed to do, and they know when they're receiving orders. And if they don't, they they get them again and again till they figure it out, right? For example, like let's say when they want you, when they want social media to start censoring people in the truth community, they start talking about crazy conspiracy theorists and how they're going to bring the system down. And they start naming the companies, Facebook, YouTube, and, and these things. And they immediately take action. And if that action is sufficient, there'll be a news report saying they're not doing enough. And then they're expected to do more. And if they don't, there's going to be congressional hearings. There'll be some way of, you know, there'll be newspaper stories about it. How YouTube is failing, Facebook is failing, whatever. Now tri Twitter and Elon Musk attacking them constantly. So they're telling you what you they need you to do, right? What, they're, what they want you to do in terms of these, you know, corporate giants, all of it. Like it goes across the board. For example, they're not looking into what caused COVID. Right, you know something that did real damage and you know affected the economy and uh, everything on so many levels. They're not putting any effort into writing articles and doing deep dives into what actually caused COVID and bringing that to light as journalists or as governments or as medical professionals, because they know what it is and they're not you know they don't want you to know, but they do want you to they do want the truth community censored, for example. And so they have a way of letting everybody know what to do. And as I go through my story, I left that piece out because there's always articles, there's always, you know, ways of letting the powers that be know it's time to rein this thing in. And, you know, that's what they've done here. And so as I go through my narrative, first I'm going to show you some video clips of just uh, some stuff that supports what I'm talking about here in different ways. And then I'm going to go into a long narrative of my story personally, but how it, you know, was for everybody and the changes that were implemented to, you know, try to suffocate the so-called truth community, right? And they can do it on an individual basis. They can make your life, you know, miserable enough so you quit making videos. They can frustrate you, whatever. But they can't stop the truth from coming out because it's coming out anyway, which I get into. And there's one more thing about this. This is why they use symbology. This is why there's hidden handshakes in the Freemasonic order. They have ways of communicating. And all they have to do is train you 
in a you know non-official way somebody explains the system to you in a way that you know can't be traced back to the system it's a scam right they explain the scam to you they explain the rules the parameters and the subtleties and the secret communication and symbology and you know once you know those things they only need a few people in charge of every organization who knows what's going on and knows how to read these things to implement a, you know, a change without ever having to have a meeting, without ever, ever have anything that can be leaked as a document. And, of course, even if those things are leaked, the media is not covering it at this point. It's over, right? And so, you know, but they can't stop the system from collapsing, right? They can't stop their scam from being, you know, uh, subject to divinity, right, from being uh, erased for, its, uh, for being an abomination of divinity. And that's what's happening now with our system. So they have a good system of control, but they can't control it. And they can't control what's, you know, it's ultimate, it's ultimate demise. All right, so let's get into the, the clips here first. Okay, greetings, brothers and sisters. I want to switch over to my voiceover in just a moment. This is a video, bonus video uh, on my Pox of the Future channel because I've been covering this with the YouTube uh, not or Google not allowing me to buy ad time <laughs> on their platform because of their it has nothing to do with me being a truther but uh, you know it's just the whole thing and I want to explain this in more detail because I think it's important I want to give a history of how things have progressed in a negative way for so-called people in the truth community and I want to start here and then move over to the voiceover. How, uh, you know, YouTube and social media kills the, tries to kill truther channels and the truth movement. And so, um, and drives people to extremism. They say they're against extremism, but they drive people to extremism. And so, um, if you search for Pox the Future, at least what I do on Google, it gives you LinkedIn, my LinkedIn account, which um, I haven't bothered with in years. There's three followers, right? <laughs> like it has, it's an obscure, um, non, you know, whatever it is. It has a couple of these mirror trails where people who, apparently this guy's name is James Matheson, who have taken my content, some of it, against my will and against my permission, which I clearly state and put it up on different platforms. Um, I'm not sure what this is, Pox of Future Songs and whatever. Then it gets down to my Instagram account, which doesn't link you to my YouTube videos. And then this other, I don't know, Nordics, Pockets of the Future, right? Now, these are all people that came to the party late. Um, on Patreon, you can find it. You know, Eventually, my Patreon account comes up. But then if you hit videos... You'd think at least my videos would come up. Um, but no, this clown, new forms of collaboration of Pockets of the Future, this is stuff that, you know, long after I'd established this term and this name in 2007, they're now posting things from other people. Not one of my videos is here. And YouTube would make money because both of my channels are monetized. So you have to come all the way down to here before you get to my YouTube channel, right? So then there's this. May Harvard caps and Harris poll. Trump now beats Biden by seven points in 2024 presidential matchup. This is from Yahoo News, but what they don't get to is this. The poll, this is the same poll. It says a majority of American voters express worries regarding the FBI possible interference in future presidential elections, according to a poll published by Harvard Caps Harris. The poll showed that 70% of respondents were either very or somewhat concerned about the interference of intelligence agencies, including the FBI, in elections, also the CIA. And so that happened, right? This is a poll that they're not talking about the results because they never do. And so the reason I'm showing this in terms of what I'm saying here, the first part about me talking about how they are sabotaging themselves by not promoting my YouTube channel when people are searching for Pockets of the Future 
because it's going to make them money, right? It's going to drive them to their platform. So Google is screwing YouTube and, you know, <laughs> based in whatever prejudicial algorithms and things they have there. And the other piece here is that people have lost trust in the government and the media. Like, I don't agree with, uh, I'm not saying the Trumpers are right here or any of those things. You guys who watch me regularly know what I, my position is on that. But with 70% of Americans who have been polled here saying they don't trust the FBI not to fear and they believe the FBI will interfere with elections, that means they don't trust the FBI, they don't trust the electoral process, they don't trust the media, they're not buying into the story, right? And that's, you know, a huge number. And it shows where people are at. Like, there's just a lack of trust there, a lack of faith, and also a lack of competence by the government and the media and social media and all these other, you know, big businesses and powerful entities. And then this. Nobody imagined it would go on this long. Bud Light sales continue to plummet over the Mulvaney backlash. There's also stuff to do with Target. Target removes some of the LBGTQ merchandise from stores after threats to workers. So um, they put out stuff with, like, uh, someone sent me a video where they had, like, uh, shorts for boys, uh, biological boys, that were for young kids, you know, five years old or whatever it was, maybe younger, that had um, uh, the ability to help them tuck. And so somebody posted a video about this and, you know, someone on Instagram and somebody on Instagram sent me this, right? And there's backlash to it. Like, you know, the kind of backlash that could destroy Target, right? there, you know, these could put them out of business. Naturally a media character whose entire style is to create engagement with us. That's, and DeSantis is doing this other thing, which is almost like listening too closely to Trump and taking it totally literally and not talking to the, to the media. I think that's a sort of a strange move. And particularly if you look at the demographics of the Iowa caucuses where they're going to, yeah. where this is actually going to happen. You have, I was just looking at the, at the entrance polls in 16. I think there are more people, about the same number of people over 65 as there are under 45. So it's a, I'm not sure it's the sort of, I'm not sure it's a social Twitter audience. So I'm including this. I saw this this morning when I was eating breakfast. And, I'm including this because there's a lot here. This is the new look without Don Lyman's uh, Mia, Mia, uh, CNN morning show. And it was always horrible in terms of it's, you know, all this stuff is horrible, but they were particularly bad in terms of the ratings. But they're talking about here, they're going to talk about uh, DeSantis announcing his candidacy on Twitter with Elon Musk and how they, you know, they're laughing and smiling and making a, a mockery of it. But we know that it's serious because they talk about this. You're going to see Donnie O'Sullivan, the, the guy I always put a leprechaun hat. I'm not going to do it here. But look at these people and listen to these people and you and think about how many people you know like this, who act like this and think like this, right? <laughs> like these are not normal people. These are not average people. There's very few people like this because they're faking everything and they're they're weird when they're not right so let's get into it here but within the republican conservative right-wing online space you know this isn't necessarily just mainstream media quote-unquote versus twitter and social media internally within that space uh, you know twitter is now competing with the websites like rumble uh, you know people we normally think of like it's twitter versus facebook versus youtube uh now now you know twitter and, and rumble which is a new video platform that donald trump jr is on exactly has signed exclusive partnerships with a lot of influential figures on the right uh twitter is now competing for those people as well so that's Tony o'sullivan i don't have time to put a leprechaun hat on him but i often do um you know i'm also irish i'm part irish <laughs> but um, Donny is, and I have no problem with it being Irish, obviously. It's the, um, he's an anti-truther. Like his whole thing was to go off after so-called conspiracy theorists. And all the things he's been associated with, including um, CNN Plus, and he was often on that show with Brian Stelter, the show, whatever it was, um, that went off the air. And so he... Um, like nobody's watching him. He's not. They're uninterested in this, 
you know, narrative. But he's talking about Rumble and Twitter competing for right-wing truthers. And again, there's no such thing as a right-wing truther, but that's what he's talking about. And that demographic is so vast and so energized, and all the you know alternative media is so vast and energized. It's a huge block of people where CNN and MSNBC are competing for a small portion of the population that's dying because they're older people, right? Like, so they never acknowledge that. Like, he's making it sound like they're competing, these other these other groups, but they've already wiped the floor with you and your network, right? You know, so this is indicative of that. And, and worth noting, David Sachs, who's going to be the person moderating this interview tonight with Ron DeSantis on the Twitter spaces that's being co-hosted by DeSantis and Elon Musk, is not just a DeSantis supporter, but a Rumble supporter and affiliated with them. And so I'm looking forward to 2024, to Doni's point, seeing what the infighting is, not just between the mainstream outlets trying to grab for candidates, that's what it's always been, but these new sort of right-leaning outlets mm. that are going to be competing for their attention. Yeah, it's totally fascinating. And that he's a big voice in the business community, too. Yes. It's also interesting, given DeSantis versus Disney. We're and shocked he, by that. He, But he yeah. defended uh, how DeSantis handled COVID back in 2021. Yeah. He was uh-huh. a big fan of that. And also, I think that what everyone is watching today is not just how he's launching this, but what that actually looks like, and if it does help him, given he has been slipping in the polls. I don't watch the news as much because YouTube TV, which I used to go, see, this is why I got a I'm videoing this with my phone, and the audio's not as good. The video's not as good. I used to be able to copy it on YouTube TV, but they put some kind of block in there. So you can't do that, even though CNN wants you to do it, because they want anybody to see them anywhere, right? Like CNN, CNN doesn't copyright anything, because they're whatever. Um, but there's roundtable situations, and it's become more and more of this, where everybody knows everything everyone else is talking about. But they're pretending to teach each other and bring in new information into the conversation. But it's remedial and everybody knows it, right? It's the, you know, it's like so lame. And they just keep on going back and forth saying things that they all know and their viewers should know. And if their viewers don't know, they're like brain dead, right? <laughs> it's absolutely like wonderful watching them. You know, it's like these TV shows where the audience is really stupid. So the TV characters have to constantly explain the plot and the storyline to the people watching because their audience is so stupid they can't figure it out for themselves, right? I guess Fox is first on television because it's audio only on this Twitter announcement. By the way, given Twitter, Twitter under Musk has not always like been able to stand up in terms of like the, the platform has literally dropped. That's what Caitlin times. was... So hopefully the audio... Like, the, hopefully the thing doesn't collapse under the pressure. Yeah, it's done as non zero Yeah, thank you guys very, very much. So Doni said under and collapse under the pressure. Pressure? I can't even... <laughs> but let's get into the... Um, they were talking about Ron DeSantis, which, you know, he sucks. He's... Kind of a weird do, but whatever. Uh, but there is an exodus now, and people are leaving blue states to go to Florida and other places, and which I know this factually and experientially. Like, I'm aware of this uh, in terms of my travels. From those breathtaking beaches to a jump in new jobs, Florida is booming, attracting more new residents from across the country than any other state in America. Tell me what your metal checklist was in terms of determining a move to Florida. So I'm switching over to the voiceover section here. And I want to talk about how um, this is self-sabotage, right? And so somebody wrote this uh, to my video. What happened to this guy's views? He used to get hundreds of thousands of views. And this wasn't until my, um, my YouTube video, right? <laughs> like my YouTube sucks. I made a video called YouTube and Google suck right now yesterday. And then I had a video that was uh, for YouTube ad that I created. So I want to explain this through my story, which is, you know, I mean, it's what YouTube and social media has done, as well as Trump and Trumpers and the QBs and all these different players, because it's a complex... Not all that complex, but it's a, you know, a social paradigm, and I'm going to explain what happened. So my YouTube channel started in 2007 with homesteading videos. So this was me documenting my then family, which is 
now fallen apart, living on a homestead and learning to do homesteading things. And then I would talk about some spirituality stuff and some truth or stuff occasionally. It was low tech, you know, the videos were not of a good quality because I was having trouble converting the, you know, I was using a video camera to document these things. And I, you know, was a it was sort of a hobby. I was writing books and doing other things, trying to get, you know, a whole, the pockets of a future was going to be more of a website than it was going to be just a YouTube channel. And so it was just a secondary thing. In the beginning, I made videos fairly often, once a week, whatever it is, um, different kinds of videos, right, that were, were just, you know, me videoing farmer life and things. Then I learned to use YouTube's Movie Maker, which was, a, you know, a low-tech uh, app that they discontinued after a while because it sucks for most people. I enjoyed using it. You know, for me, it was a big deal. And I started to make truther videos posting um, images there and doing a voiceover. And, you know, it was time-consuming and it was hard for me to do. And I produce, you know, one movie every once in a while, one video it ended up being near the end, like once every month, like YouTube channel was sort of forgotten. I had maybe a thousand subscribers or so. Got, you know, a hundred views on videos. I don't think, you know, one video got a hundred thousand views, which was a big deal because, you know, it was more than the normal. And it was, it was a video entitled Planting Blueberry Bushes. And it took me a long time to understand. It was me and my kids planting blueberry bushes. It took me a long time to understand that people thought it was blueberry marijuana. <laughs> it was some kind of pot plant named blueberry. And they thought, in fact, one person wrote, while well, you're really low, making your kids plant your pot plants for you. Uh, <laughs> that's what I kind of realized. Oh, they're talking about something else. So that they get arrested and not you. Because someone thought I was. And then why would I video it, right? Like, just it was stupid. But that's, you know, that was one video that popped or whatever. But other than that, I didn't really have anything that was a widely viewed video. You know, I get maybe some thousands of views on some of them. And it was monetized. I made about $100 a month off videos. You know, it was, I mean, I think that was like the maximum. And, you know, nothing really that special. And I wasn't putting much effort into it. It wasn't a, a full-time job. Then I started making more and more truther videos. Some of them covered celebrity stuff, you know, still not a lot of views, but, you know, it was a kind of changed in format. My family sold the farm and we were in the process of going camping for a, a summer and then spending extended time in India. But then some things happened. Like I was, you know, basically going through a middle of divorce, which was uh, open things up because my ex was sabotaging, you know, whatever we were doing as a family. And while we were in India, and while we were in India, the third master of the system died, and he had, you know, was kind of against talking about Saj Marg on uh, social media, and, and that, you know, seemed to open things up as well. And I saw a video about Michelle Obama being a, possibly being a dude, and you know, I thought it was a goofy video. You know, when I first saw it, I watched it anyway because I don't know, like, I, whatever reason, and I looked into their claims. Now, some of the claims were exaggerated. Some of the claims were, um, you know, kind of goofy. But some of the stuff, you know, made kind of sense, right? It was, it was uh, there was some, you know, scientific backing for it. There was some legitimate reasoning there. And I was surprised by that, right? Because, you know, it seemed like a goofy idea. And I did all this research, so I said I might as well make my own video because, um, you know... <laughs> That, uh, you know, because I wasted all this time fact-checking the things that these people had said. And I made a video entitled, There's a 95% Chance Michelle Obama is a Dude. And it, I think Serena Williams was involved in, and Jennifer Aniston because I had seen she had kind of man hands when I had made a video about her, about a, a TV a movie she made called Picture Perfect that was filled with like Illuminati stuff. That had been one of my few celebrity videos I had made up to that point. And that video popped, and I also made a, a video. You know, I started to, um, Dave Chappelle was claiming that there was a rite of passage for black actors and comedians to become mainstream, and they had to put on a dress. 
And, you know, this was kind of documented. But then I looked into it and I saw that pretty much every A-list actor, whether they were black or white, had to put on a dress at some time, had to put on female clothing. And gone on, even like people like John Wayne. And so I made a video documenting that. And that video popped as well. That there was a correlation between A-list celebrities and putting on f women's clothing. Almost all of them had to do it at some point. Some of them, like Will Smith, Will Smith had to do a, a three-minute belly dance in Wild Wild West. So it was, a, you know, it was a thing they wanted to see, right? Men, you know, these men putting on dresses. So it was a, you know, Hollywood, whatever. Um, again, these videos weren't great. Like, I, you know, I wouldn't publish them now. I, you know, I've matured and, you know, evolved as a creator and in and, and the way I think about things. But back then I had bought more into anything that was coming through the truth community. I was predisposed to believe it to be true, like so many people in the beginning of their, you know, kind of waking up, right? Those videos now would probably violate a number of community guidelines uh, from YouTube, and it shows you how YouTube has changed because of that. But back then, uh, community guidelines wasn't a thing. The big issue was copyright strikes. Um, I didn't have the ability to copy videos, you know, either in terms of my skill level or in terms of my apps, or whatever apps that I had. So it really wasn't an issue for me. I guess I could do a little bit of video stuff at some point. But copyright wasn't really the, you know, was a concern, but it was something that I didn't worry about it as much as most people who was making videos. But in terms of community guidelines, you could pretty much post anything and get it monetized, right? There wasn't very much scrutiny, like, in terms of, community guideline strikes, or the demonetization of videos, right? There was no fact checkers, there was no anything. And pretty much everything in the YouTube community was being ignored by the mainstream media and everybody else. And so there wasn't much of anything, much scrutiny in terms of what post people posted as content. It wasn't taken seriously and it was supposed to be ignored. In 2013, Alex Jones gave an interview with Pierce Morgan and he did a disastrous job because he was a shill and you know they were trying to make Alex Jones the face of the truth community which in some ways he was back then you know he was controlled opposition all along but he got goofy that's when he started to get really goofy and act in a way that was something they could pathologize and say that everybody's a crazy who believes in these things is crazy conspiracy theorists but he did a an interview with Megyn Kelly later, and, and all of a sudden now they were, you know, the YouTube videos and social media was on the radar of politicians and mainstream media because it was growing exponentially and people were turning to the Internet for their news. They were walking away from traditional news and all these narratives were being uncovered, some of them true, some of them bogus didn't really matter, and this information was out there, and it was in direct contradiction to the official story. So it was the first acknowledgement, and they were creating a profile of people in the truth community as right-wing, nutjob, crazy conspiracy theorists. That was when the profile was being, you know, sort of introduced and how they were going to deal with it, right? Of course, now we see what's happened with that. It's expanded and become a, a big deal. So now they were acknowledging that there are people posting videos and content on the internet that was in contradiction to the official story and that these people were crazy and they were conspiracy theorists, which is a, you know, derogatory term for somebody who's questioning the, you know, abusive system that we all, you know, know about, right? And then, you know, all these other things developed. But then Trump won the election and whether they wanted him to win the election because of these things. I mean, there's some debate about that, the powers that be. But there was some shock within the media. Some people were flipped out by it, whatever. I mean, genuinely, we saw their reaction. And Hillary Clinton started to say that it was fake news that cost her the election, that there was these websites, right-wing websites, truther websites, and YouTube channels and things out there 
that made up stuff about her, the Podesta stuff, the pizza stuff that was happening, right? And then there was a joint panel, a joint task force of the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA that did a report on this, the idea of the election being influenced by Russia, Russia Today YouTube channel, and you know some of these other things, which is completely bogus because Russia Today got no views and wasn't really all that respected. And the people that watched Russia Today and these other truther channels were no way going to vote for Hillary. And so there was no, you know, there was there was no cost to her based in this these narratives because the people who were receiving this inter- information weren't independent voters, right? And so it had nothing to do with that, the reason she lost the election. But they said there was election interference and the term fake news was born. And then on top of that, there was an event that happened in England where somebody had watched a YouTube video and reacted in a way, some sort of truther-like video, and reacted in a way that, um, you know, caused some suffering. I don't know, maybe somebody got hurt or some kind of bogus thing, right? And there was a push by all these big corporations, you guys remember this, in 2015, really 2016, that was called the ad apocalypse. The ad apocalypse. <laughs> I can't even say it right, right? Um, and that was even people like Pootie Pie, right? There was these people who were selected to be, uh, and I'll get into that in a moment. We'll back to that. But there were, these ads were being pulled by McDonald's and by, you know, uh, Coca-Cola. Just all these big corporations were saying they weren't going to run ads on YouTube anymore because they didn't like the content. They didn't want to be associated with the content. And that was when the scrutiny began for all these so-called, you know, truther channels and any sort of, uh, you know, fringe level channel. And this, you know, this covered all kinds of big channels. Pootie Pie was making $12 million a year off of ad revenue and it went down to next to nothing, right? He made videos about this. You know, Pootie Pie was a, you know, kind of a joke. But even popular YouTubers were complaining about this. And I made a video saying we should tell our viewers to boycott these companies. If they don't want to support this platform, you should have all your viewers hear about, you know, the way they're screwing you and us. Go after one thing. Go after Walmart. And, you know, these companies live with very slim margins. And if you hit their margins, I mean, you can see it now. I'm I'm talking about what's happening with Bud Light and now Target. Now they're reacting the way that YouTube reacted, right? because of boycotts. I said, the one thing you could do is boycott. That's all you got. You can't talk about it. That's not going to change anything. You can't make videos and talk about things. You know, they don't care about that anymore. It became obvious in 2016, which I'll get to in a moment, right? But for that period of time, I said, look, boycott one of these big companies. Make them cave, right? Anybody who's boycotting YouTube because they didn't want to run ads, because if they wanted the contract, the content to be you know, to be uh, scrutinized in some way. All you had to do was boycott. But no one wanted to hear that, right? No one cared. Uh, you know, because there's lots of... And this went across all of these YouTube channels, which was far more powerful than cable news or cable TV and all the, all the various, you know, TV channels and things uh, were not getting nearly the amount of views that we were getting on YouTube. And there was a, a connection between YouTubers and their audience influencers like they didn't you know this was back when the term influencer wasn't even there yet right Instagram wasn't really a thing or whatever and so um you know being able to uh inflict some pain on these corporations through boycotting was the last chance to do something to you know save freedom of speech or whatever but nobody wanted to hear that then you know now you see it's it's coming late to the party But then something happened in 2016 uh, where they started to scrutinize people talking about Caitlyn Jenner or some of these other topics to do with like the bathroom. Uh, There was a bathroom bill being put out there by North Carolina and they said that you had to be a biological male or female to use the men's room or the women's room, right? You remember this? The bathroom bill. And corporations were threatening to pull their 
corporate interests out of the state. And they lost the NBA All-Star game that was supposed to be in the, you know, the, in the city of Charlotte or whatever it is, right? Um, and the polls were 60% of people were against, uh, you know, were for the bathroom bill. 60% of people said that they didn't like what was happening with this new gender stuff. You know, it was just the beginning of it. They didn't believe in it. Only 20% were for it, and some people just didn't know yet, right? They didn't understand the issue, like 18% or whatever it is. So an overwhelming majority was on the side of North Carolina, and the businesses didn't care. And it was the first time I ever saw this as an American where the customer was no longer always right. And this is what I'm referencing in, in terms of these polls, because they don't care what you think anymore. They don't care what your opinion is. They're not, you know taking into consideration your opinion. They're just pushing their agenda. And that happened in 2016. And so that was the beginning of the demonetization of videos, YouTube scrutinizing their monetization policies, and then pushing for community guideline issues and strikes, which were punitive because they, you know, they stopped you from uploading a video for a whole week even though they often made mistakes or they were changing these guidelines and they were doing it retroactively. It wasn't fair. It wasn't considerate of the, you know, the population that it was a big part of the, you know, YouTube community was what was called conspiracy theory videos or truth or videos, but not just that people who were, you know, whatever they were, you know, more extreme in their presentation and YouTube said, all right, you we're going to scrutinize the videos even more so that than things that are on, mainstream TV, right? For example, just, I don't know, a week ago, there was a Britney Spears video where I, you know, I did a short video of her uh, on Instagool dancing in a bikini with a cowboy hat. It was kind of funny and I want to put it up there, but I knew it might be something they de demonetized because it's questionable. But she's fully clothed, right? She's not naked and she's not doing anything inappropriate in the video. But it's something you'd, you'd see on mainstream television all the time. It's not, you know, it's not something that they would, you know, the, the that wouldn't be considered advertiser unfriendly for mainstream TV. But YouTube has made the, the video, this short video, advertiser unfriendly, right? It's not advertiser friendly. So they've scrutinized even, they're the, even more than mainstream television has, right? Excessive swearing, especially in the beginning of a video, is no longer tolerated, just all these ways. And so now YouTube is picking winners and losers in terms of being able to make a living off of their videos. And also, of course, the various levels of content. So that's, you know, how YouTube started to squeeze the truth community. You couldn't make money off of these videos anymore the extreme ones. You had to be careful about what you talked about. Some subjects were taboo. You couldn't talk about them at all. And then they would also make these rules. And if you had older videos, you would get guideline strikes for them, even though the rule at the t time, they were totally legal at the time, right? They were totally monetizable. And, you know, of course, that's a little bit different. But in terms of the community guideline strikes, they would go back and give community guideline strikes to older videos, right? Which... um you know, it was really unfair <laughs> because at the time the videos were completely acceptable and that caused lots of problems. Now you had to go back and look through your old videos or make them private or delete them. And then they just started to make the rules more and more restrictive. But then the big thing happened as this continued 2017, 2018, um, you know, even maybe earlier than that, where CNN and MSNBC and all these you know, politicians and people were complaining about disinformation. And, you know, people, I mean, it's okay for the government to put out disinformation. It's, it's okay for, uh, you know, media and corporations to just post out and out lies and do things that are unsafe and they have all this power. But you as an individual, if you, you know, were saying things that didn't agree with the, the mainstream story, the mainstream narrative, you were somehow the threat to this civilization, which you are, which we all are, because once people realize it's all a joke and a lie, 
the system collapses. So it's a real legitimate threat. And I, I can understand why they would have to do something because the system would collapse. You know, people think the truth will set you free. Well, in this case, it'll set you free by destroying the system, right? <laughs> because the truth in the system cannot, cannot go hand in hand. And so, you know, it's, bu it's built on perception, the economic system and everything else. And once you lose that perception, when people don't buy into the system and lose trust, which we know has happened, that the majority of people don't trust the media and politicians and corporations in levels and ways that, w that weren't there before the Internet. And this is widespread. And it's a huge concern. They're probably one of their number one concerns because it could easily bring down the system at any moment. I mean, people are still addicted to the system, so they're, you know, not, they're not actionable. But their perception of the system has created, you know, on a, like a spiritual level, uh, like a fault line, and bringing truth and reality into a deceptive system always brings it down, no matter what, you know, no matter what happens. Eventually, it brings it down. So YouTube went to authoritarian news, and what they called authoritarian news, authoritative news. And they said they were going to recommend authoritative news, Google search and YouTube. When you search for something, you were looking for a truth or video, they would recommend CNN and MSNBC. Their algorithms were telling you, you don't want to watch this, you want to watch that. And they started to give preference to these news platforms that had their own platform. They CNN has you know, cable news platform and a their own, you know, website and uh, an internet, MSNBC, Fox, they all have that, right? <laughs> you know, they all have it, but, you know, they started giving preference and pushing these things when people didn't want those things. They were specifically looking for something, not that. This was a case where, again, another case where the big business, big corporate business, were saying customers no longer are always right. In fact, we're telling you, you're wrong. You're saying you want this, but our search engine is going to give you this. And with that, they stopped giving notifications and they would unsubscribe people to, you know, any of these channels that were considered undesirable. It's a, it's a pro, you know, it's a platform problem. It's not just for, um, you know, for, uh, for truth or channels, but it's, you know, s specific towards us in, in some ways, right? More so than others. So that person that asked that question, this channel used to get all kinds of views. Why, why is it getting less? Well, this is a big reason because, you know, when I published these big videos years and years ago, the Michelle Obama got 2 million views. And I had all these, you know, I had a, a Beyonce Illuminati video that got uh, a million views in like the first day. And again, I don't make videos like that. And I'll explain that too, because that's part of the issue. But these videos would go out and people were interested in them. The celebrity videos anything to do with the Illuminati back then. You know, I made videos on various subjects that were, you know, sort of mainstream YouTube viral videos. And it would bring in lots and lots of people and expose the channel to lots and lots of new people. And a few of those people would stick around, like a small percentage of them would find my other videos and the way I view things and the content that I create worthy of watching on a daily basis, right? Majority of people wouldn't but it would expose the channel to a large segment of the population, which would booster the subscriber rate and then the rest of it. But that all stopped. And not just for me, but any, you know, anybody in the truth community. Your videos were very isolated to a, a closed community. And even in that, it wasn't being recommended. So new people just don't get to see my stuff, right? And the old people don't get notified. And so... They would purge out subscribers. They were constantly purging out subscribers. People who wanted to be subscribed would get unsubscribed for no reason. It doesn't matter, right? Having a, a subscriber on your channel doesn't mean anything. You know, if the person's not watching, but why purge them out? Why the person can choose out anytime they want? Why does YouTube have to do that at all? Why, why would YouTube, I mean, it, it's counterproductive to their business model to get rid of subscribers to people's channels. But you know that there's a whole level of complex things with YouTube and and why they do that, right? And so my channel isn't getting out there to new people. And so eventually people get tired of the channel or they move on to something else or they forget about it or you know they're you know you lose people 
just inevitably. People who like your content, but, you know, they're not going to watch it forever. And that's fine. You know, that's, you know, expected. But I'm not getting the new people that I would normally get, right? And there's a lot of reasons for this. Now, first of all, like there was these fringe groups that developed, right? First it was, it's a man, it's a dude, right? Like, so I kind of started that. I was one of the founding, which I'm not proud of, you know, that, that, that segment was saying that all these people were actually the opposite sex, you know, Hollywood celebrities or whatever it was, you know, and I hinted at that and I, you know, said that that could be possible. But then there was a whole movement that said it was fact. And during that period of time, I realized that some of the things I said in my videos and way I was making my videos, like I would only choose the pictures and the images that supported my argument. And that wasn't fair, right? Like I realized personally that that wasn't being truthful. I was only, you know, taking the pictures that, you know, that supported my thesis. And I wasn't looking at all the evidence. And that wasn't cool. And I was stating things like fact because they were things that beliefs that we all shared in the truth community, but they weren't facts. And other things that, you know, there was narratives out there, um, like the thermite narrative, for example, that is completely bogus. But I took it as fact because I thought other people had checked it out and they didn't. People just put out information. They would get this idea of something. They would put it out and without really having any scientific or, you know, any real evidence, we just state it like it was fact. So I started to make a distinction between speculation and fact, right? And I also realized sensationalizing things wasn't cool either. Like you had to do some of that just to get views or whatever. But it was something where I, you know, I wasn't comfortable with that anymore. And so I was evolving and maturing as a presenter. And of course, there was these other groups. There was the Flat Earthers. There was all the, the you know, eventually the QBs. There was all these other groups that started to be, you know, uh, strong voices in the so-called truth community. Of course, there's lots of Christians and right-wing people. And I was none of those things. I, I didn't agree with those movements. I didn't believe in the same things these people believed in. And so that hurt me, right? Because it started to trend towards right-wing people. And then, of course, Trumpers and all these other people. And they drove the, you know, the, the content to extremism, extremism and sensationalistic stuff. So where I would post something on Tom Hanks giving things that were, you know, legitimate, creepy stuff he had done that was caught on video, things that were, you know, that, you know the Tyler's and Tierras thing where they were making up stuff like he had been, he would been uh, rendered and taken to Guantanamo Bay and was suffering, you know, was going through a secret military tribunal. That's what the QBs were pushing. And you couldn't compete with that, right? Because people want sensationalistic things. You can't be a reasonable person and present reasonable information. And this is the way that YouTube's policies and, you know, this narrative being created drove things to an extremism, not just YouTube, but all social media, because they wanted that. Like the powers that be wanted people to be extreme. And so extreme people would have a, a large audience and they could go to some other platform if you sided with something that was, you know, that people wanted other people to validate their beliefs, to say that their beliefs were okay. And I wasn't willing to do that, especially when I knew for, you know, whatever, the, factually and in other ways that this, a lot of this stuff was disinformation and goofy and it was just being made up by people. And when you told people that they got upset and not only didn't want to watch your content, but were troll you or, you know, be just, you know, whatever it was, right. Hostile towards your, your channel, because people don't like to be told that their beliefs are effed up, right. They want to hear people validate their beliefs. And so all of that was happening to me in this channel, right. Because I, wasn't any of these things. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't a Republican. I wasn't a right-wing person. I wasn't a, in any of these various, you know, subcategories that had a lot of energy in them. Of course, the Q movement, all these things. And I was actually saying those things are wrong and suck. And that just, you know, kept on shrinking my audience in the truth community. And I didn't have access to, you know, new people through YouTube's policies. And so, you know, it just sort of, um, shrank my channel and my potential audience base. You know, I became an extreme fringe person in an already fringe group. Of course, my, you know, doing the 
Sajmarg meditation and things struck people, some people the wrong way. They didn't like my beliefs on God, spirituality. So it just became more and more people, even in the truth community, weren't interested in what I was saying. They wanted to hear the same old videos, Illuminati stuff, things that I had evolved past, things that I, you know, either they were no longer important or important to me. And, you know, I just couldn't make the same videos day in and day out. And then YouTube made it difficult for people who had to monetize their videos to cover topical things. So people who were doing this as a hobby or could get, uh, you know, get donation-based channels could talk about more extreme things and things in a different way. They had more freedom to talk about things. And so that became an issue, right? Where, you know, in terms of a, a, a sensationalized, uh, you know, uh, explosive-based content, right? Anything that's sensational, even if it's not true, things that would drive viewers to the video. Like I just wasn't, you know, into doing that anymore. And YouTube made it next to impossible to cover various topics. Of course, now the stuff to do with the gender stuff and to do with, you know, the eventually the you know what, the you know, the Voldemort. And so, you know, I was limited to what I would cover and still be able to get my video views uh, videos monetized. You know, having this be a job made it hard. And then people just putting extreme content out there that wasn't true false content that drove people to that, you know, the sensationalistic stuff, the right wing. So it was a combination of the truth community sucking and going in a, like a, like a, you know, st towards stupid people. Like it became stupider, you know, and just not, you know, not based in truth or fact. And then YouTube and social media pushing people towards that. Because, you know, if you went extreme, if you went and you, you know, you pandered to this, you know, the QBs or the Trumpers, you could have huge audience and they would support you financially through donations. And you could go to some third person platform, third platform, and you could, you know, make money doing it that way. You wouldn't have access to as many people, but you would have, you know, a large fringe audience that was agreeing with your position. And then you were just stuck in that role making the same videos over and over again, you know, appeasing the, you know, people that, I mean, just, you know, it's just not me, right? And so those are the reasons, like, that's where we are. And because YouTube won't do their job as my partner, because I've been making money for them since 2007, and specifically over the last so many years, you know, we have a, a partnership where I'm producing content that is bringing in money and, you know, interest into their platform. Because they're, you know, not willing to notify my subscribers, unsubscribe people, and change their algorithms so that new people don't see me. And even in the, the Google search, not putting my channel first, when you search Pockets of the Future, my channels, my two channels should be there first, right? Under Google search, it's good for Google, it's, you know, good for their business, but they don't even have it. It's not even, you know, like I showed you that earlier. And because they won't, aren't willing to do that, I thought that I would have to take out ads on their platform, give them more of my money, right? And, you know, push the channel for them. And which, I mean, if people come to my channel and watch the videos and, and you know, there are ads there running, that it benefits YouTube, right? In so many different ways, it benefits Google. And so I was going to have to pay them money. It's like paying protection money to them to run ads. And I didn't even know if that was going to work, but I have to do something because my channel is just dying now. Both of them are dying because they've cut the ad revenue and all these other things, not just for truthers, but everybody. And so it's like a dying platform and they're, you know, self-sabotaging. And, you know, to do something to save at least my portion of it, I was willing to run ads. And then they did this bogus thing saying the credit card that they recommended when I went to pay for the ads was a suspicious payment, even though it's been on my Google Plus account, Blue Gold, whatever, Google Pay account forever, you know, <laughs> they said it was suspicious, and they suspended my account before it ran one ad, like, so that's what I'm dealing with, right, like, it's just, you know, it's maddening, okay, so I just went and ate breakfast, and I wanted to, you know, finish this off with this, a lot of people in the truth community say, oh, they're losing, you know, the, the powers that be, and it's not something like that, because most of the people in the truth community are, like I said, are looking for validation and wanting their war to belief system to be confirmed, even though they're, you know, more aware of the some level of truth than the mainstream people or the sheeple. 
they're still warped in their views, right? They're attached to things that are false, whether it be their religion, whether it be their political leanings, whatever it might be, right? It's all of us. We're all, we're all um, subjective. So it isn't that. It isn't a personal victory. But what it is is there's a time where the truth has to come out. There's a time when your civilization that's imposing your government, that's imposing these warped views. I mean, the truth, the truth always has to come out, right? The truth inevitably has to come out. I mean, we're all facing the truth, right? We're suppressing our abilities to see the truth. Like we're suppressing our, you know, the truth is there and we're warping reality to, you know, to make it fit into what our psychological, egotistical point of view is, right? Our, you know, our psyche says, right, this is reality. And then when something says, no, you're wrong about that, you rearrange reality to make it, you know, so that you don't have to change your, your view and open up to the truth, right? So the truth is always there for every one of us. Some of us are just more flexible with it. Some of us are more open to admitting that we're wrong or admitting that we don't see things clearly or admitting that we have to grow and evolve and change. People who think that they've made it, people who are arrogant, think that they're special, you know, the, the king of England, or the queen of England saying that they're God's representative on earth, right? That we have eminent domain, right? All these things. We're doing God's will. And, you know, that, that point of view, and even when we're doing things wrong, saying we're backed by God, whatever, using God or whoever, whatever authority, we're backed by the government, we're the authority. It's okay to do those things, to rearrange things in a way through using thinking errors and, you know, to change your perception of what you're seeing, to deny reality when it's slapping you right in the face. So it's always there. And then you have to deal with it when you die. You have to deal with it at a soul level. All the mistakes your ego made, all these things, your, your inability to, to follow your soul's plan or your soul's path, right? And so the truth is there. But now it's coming up in ways that the system can no longer, it's like, you know, a dike of truth, you know, the instead of water, it's holding back the truth and it's showing holes in it. You know, there's not enough fingers to, to uh, you know, stop the dam from breaking through. And the truth come pouring out. The truth is just fl pouring out. The internet is the vehicle, and the truth community is a part of it. But it isn't, you know, the. I mean, it's how much we're aligned with the real truth of things. And very few people want to face up to the real truth of your existence and your, you know, what you're doing that your soul doesn't want you to do. I mean, pretty much everybody has something that they're denying, or you know, they're uh, they they won't allow themselves to see. But as the system implodes, they're going to have to. And they know it, the people in control of the system, because they're not doing real polling anymore. They're not telling you accurately what people feel. They're not saying, you know, they're not telling you that people are leaving blue states for red states. And that's not that the Republicans are more truthful. It's just that the, the blue, you know, the Democrats and the liberals and the you know people pushing this agenda have the power. And they're using this power, misusing this power in ways that people are freaked out about and don't want any part of, especially older people. You know, Democrats are freaked out and they're moving to red states. That's just one of many indications, indicators, that they've lost control of these narratives, right? People are freaked out by AI. They're freaked out by this new gender stuff. They're freaked out by the Hollywood morality. They're freaked out by the, the debt-based system, the, you know, all of it, right? And so they look for solutions, like somebody who seems to be outside, like Trump, who sucks. Like Trump is as demonic or maybe even worse than Joe Biden. And you're just looking at him because he's saying some of the things that you believe in, or you know, you're warping your beliefs or you know whatever, to see him as something he's not. And so that's the issue, right? And nobody wants to hear any of that stuff because people are allergic to the truth, right? And so what I do here is that I just don't care about my own, you know, beliefs. Like I don't, I say things, energy flows through it, you know, I give my analysis of stuff and, you know, I don't care about it. Like I don't, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. Like I realize my view of reality doesn't really matter. I mean, if I'm being truthful, sure. If I'm being honest, if I'm, you know, truly honest with myself or whatever it is, 
then I'm witnessing things and reporting it back to God. If I'm, you know, having a good connection with God in my soul, then I'm one of the people witnessing what's going on. And, you know, the closer you are to God, the closer you are to divinity within yourself, you reflect back reality in a much clearer way. And it's much more actionable by the divine, you know, powers that be to bring about a remedy to a dysfunctional system. You know, we're reporting back to the source, hey, this is so effed up down here, we better do something, right? And it helps move, you know, everything in a divine direction. And at some point, you know, this system's going to have to answer to divinity. It's going to have to answer to God. And, you know, I mean, there's no answering. You know, it's going to be disappeared, and then something else will take its place. And that'll be the, you know, true truth, right? That'll be the, the ultimate in, you know, okay, this is what's supposed to happen. But people don't want to hear that. They want to hear that you can fix the system. People want hopium. People want whatever. So I have a small percentage of people, but even in that, even if it's 1% of the people, that's 3 million people that could be potential viewers here. So for me, it's just getting access to them and knowing, you know, what I know about the Sajmarg meditative system, you know, what we're calling gratefulness here now, it's important in transforming people you know, it's a it's the solution, the spiritual solution that's been given for this period of time, I and mean, that's my, you know, my wholehearted understanding of it. You know, it, it keeps me sticking around, right? But again, I have to, d you know, dig in deep and find out a, a ways to, um, to make the channel grow and you know bring new people in. Because ultimately, you know, it's about having enough people to justify me picking up a microphone every day and talking into it, right? You know, and I guess there's, I mean, there's some thousands of people that, that want, to, want to hear what I have to say. So that's part of it. And the other part is to make it financially doable. Like I have to make enough money to call this a job. Like my bare minimum is $100 a day. Like it works seven days a week. And so that's $3,000 a month, right? Which isn't a lot of money, but it's, you know, I mean, that's the bare minimum. And I'm below that at this point, right? I've had some, you know, months that I've been above that or, you know, substantially above that in different time periods on YouTube, but over the last couple of years, it's been in decline. And so that's a, you know, barometer for me. And, you know, I got a, a hundred or so people, almost a hundred people that are now members, which is great, but that's, you know, it's like $500 a month, another couple hundred dollars from, um, from, uh, Patreon, which, you know, I'd hope the Patreon people would go and take advantage of the, you know, the things that I'm doing for more content on the membership, but it's just not enough. Like I can't go to a, a membership only type of situation. And then what about all the people out there that I won't reach because I'm not on a bigger platform? You know, Rumble is a, you know, a right wing platform on top of it. There just isn't a solution for me outside of YouTube, right? And YouTube is, you know, dying itself and shooting itself in its foot and, you know, self-sabotaging and, you know, being whatever it is. But, you know, if, God wants this stuff that I'm doing here to be out there, then God has to help out, right? Like I, I'm doing all that I can. The system is lined up against me, the, the truth community, and I'm not, you know, a victim here, whatever. It's just, it was obviously going to go this way. I mean, it's, you know, when people ask me, are you worried about, um, you know, a threat to your life? And I'm like, no, because they'll cancel my channel before, you know, <laughs> they're, they'll do other things before they just start killing people, right? I mean, that's that's later, like when they have to, you know, when things get more down, whatever it might be. But like, you know, I'm just not worried about it because of my connection to God. And, you know, you, there's always some risk in anything, you know, there's always going to be some risk. I feel good today and I'm positive about it, but I, you know, I'm a little bit tapped out. Like I've, you know, I've run out of options. I've done everything I can do on my end. You know, I got people giving me ideas, suggestions. I'll put an introduction to to, you know, stop people from doing that because you don't understand all of what I know, right? <laughs> like, so, you know, your suggestions are, you know, it's just, they're not good ones, right? <laughs> like, there's no suggestions in terms of I'm not going to change my evolution. I'm not going to change the way I present information here. I'm not going to change, you know, my personal growth. And, you know, I just can't do the same thing over and over again. And, you know, when I, I don't care about it, right? Like, I, I have to, you know, evolve and, you know, I'm seeing the world in a different 
way than I did even a year ago or even two years ago or whatever it might be. And so those changes are not always what people want to hear, but, you know, I need flexible people that are also growing and changing and open to change and open to expanding their consciousness and beliefs and ultimately wanting a deep connection with God. And so, you know, I could believe that that could be 50,000, 100,000 viewers, viewers per day on my channel, but how do I access them? And, you know, I have my own personal issues, which I should have brought up early, where I, you know, part of me doesn't want to grow. Part of me wants to stay under the radar. And, you know, a big part of me, like, you know, you know, it's just how I am as a person. So there's that as well. And I don't really have a desire to be famous or, you know, I mean, just, a, just enough, like just enough people to keep the channel going. I mean, that's kind of how I've always felt about it. There's a lot to be said for being under the radar. But anyways, I don't have much faith in YouTube and Google, even less now after this ad debacle. I mean, it's so ridiculous. I told my story yesterday. Like, you know, like it's weird. You know, they're weirdly inefficient and they're losing control of their platform through the AI and their own algorithms. They're going against what the customers want. They're shrinking and, you know, they're all going against truth, right? They're pushing back against divinity and and they're like, there's not even a, you know, a, an idea. I mean, they don't have different demographics for us and people who searching for God, right? They, they collect all this information. If you watch my video from yesterday, they collect all this information and yet they don't have demographics for their advertisers that want to reach out and connect with the truth community or connect with spiritual people and these other things. You know, this is their business demographics are all remedial, you know, groups of people, you know, inefficient and uninspiring groups of people, demographics that, you know, are just um, like, are just not, and not, there's no enthusiasm behind them and these things, just like so in the box, right? I couldn't believe how in, in the box they were when I had my choices of who I want these videos to go out to. It's all these, you know, remedial, generic, you know, check the box in the box kind of like uh, categories for how they're, you know, demographing people with all the data. They know what people actually have passion about and what they believe, and they're not even willing to put that out there, right? Just unbelievable. You know, like the the level of inefficiency and incompetence here. And so I'll see how this ad things works. And of course, we're doing the gratefulness thing, which I think brings energy to, I don't know. Like, I don't know how this is all going to work out. Uh, but I'm, you know, running out of answers, <laughs> you know, to, to keep this thing going. And I'm just, you know, explaining this to you. There's been a lot of good truthers that have just been worn down by all of the ways that the system is set up to screw them and and promote dopes, right? There's a lot of dopey, uh, goofy, you know, uh, double-digit IQ, non-abstract uh, thinking people who are promoted and, you know, just not on in terms of truthers, but across the internet, they, they push for stupidity and for lame content. You can see it. There's so much lame content on the internet, like so much idiocracy and things. And so, you know, it wears you down after a while, and it's just you're fighting a losing battle, which no one wants to do. But anyways, those are just some of my thoughts about the thing, and we'll see how it works. Like I said, I'm in good spirits today, and I'll continue on with this, um, you know, in future narratives. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Ravato, definitely important for the apocalypse and the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day, and be grateful.